Empire. Hello and welcome to another live stream edition of the John Conn Report. Do me a favor, subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're joining us on YouTube, do me a favor, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media. That's A-M-P-I-R-E. I think those of you who listen know how to spell it by now, but I'm always going to spell it just in case. Don't forget, you can read my work on ESPN.com. We have daily camp reports from every NFL team. And I had a story up over the weekend on Sam Howell and his progress in Washington's offense, et cetera. So before I get to your questions, and I want to get to your questions soon because my house might blow away, is if you you may hear some thunder outside because we're getting pummeled by a storm right now. So a few minutes on the practice, and then we'll get to your questions. So start throwing some questions in there for me. Today was basically, it's not like a practice like yesterday. There was no hitting, no pads. It was really kind of a glorified jog through Um, as much as anything else. So today, a lot of it was first team offense against second or third team defense. Really kind of, it's not game plan situations, but you're going over situations that you want to see the offense handle against a certain look and kind of correcting some mistakes, maybe that or working on things that you didn't get corrected during the week, that kind of situation. So really wasn't um, a a legit practice. It's funny because they had this kind of a practice last week and I started seeing some tweets from some people saying, oh, you know, uh, Sam Howell was flawless or whatever it was, or he looked great. It was, it was just a glorified jog through. You don't take away those kind of things from this kind of a situation. This is to work on situations. And that's what they got done at, at really kind of about half to three quarters speed. So the only thing that was interesting from practice was the fact that they worked out a couple people afterwards, some punters, two punters, and then looked like a couple of defensive backs. And then they had a couple of long snappers in camp. The punters are, you know, Ron Rivera told us later that Tress Way had a little bit of a tightness um, in the leg. And so they're just working out some punters just in case he can't punt for the Cleveland um, game on Friday night. So it's a just-in-case situation. One punter was lefty, one punter was righty. Um, So this isn't too unusual, I guess. You you kind of get a lot of kicks in camp, and and just like a quarterback, you wear your arm out a little bit. Anyway, so that's what's going on there. Um, Injury updates. Emmanuel Forbes was back during some of the team drills. Curtis Samuel back during some of the team drills. He he was took out or missed half a practice yesterday. Forbes did not practice during team drills yesterday. Again, glorified jog through, keep that in mind. And then Logan Thomas, not on the field. They are going to be very, very cautious with him. And they should be because, it. listen, when you get older, you start having soft tissue issues or a calf injury. You need to make sure that guy's way too important to this offense, I think. And I think he's going to be really important to this offense. Red zone, third downs. You need to make sure. I just always have concerns as guys get up there, you start getting some of those injuries. You need to make sure you keep him out long enough so that way it does not become an issue. All right. Um, and then Sadiq Charles, he was back today, did not practice with the starters. Uh, was or Excuse me. He practiced. He worked during individual stuff. When they went to the team stuff, going over all that stuff, it was Chris Paul back in there. And again, he's Charles has the minor calf strain. The hard part for Charles is he gets hurt every year. And so that's what this staff knows him as a guy who's he shows, he flashes, shows ability, but he just gets hurt. So he's going to have to get back out there and prove to them that he can be durable and consistent as listen, it's the old adage. You're the, the best available or the best ability is availability and durability. And so, you know, coaches, you always joke about being part of the able family. Are you reliable? Are you available? Are you durable? That kind of stuff. That's what Charles has to prove. He's giving Chris Paul a shot here, man. And Chris Paul, I think will do, will, will take that. And I wouldn't, it would not shock me at all to see Chris Paul emerge from this. I do know they really want to see what they have in Charles. And so the number one thing for him to do is to get healthy anyway. So that's another thing. Then the kickers talk to the media, Badgley, Joey Sly, nothing really awesome from those interviews. Listen, it's a competition, but, and I told you this a little, um, probably a week or two ago after they signed Badgley, this really comes down to for Badgley, 
well, first of all, if Joey Sly shows consistency during camp and during the preseason, it's a lock that, you know, I, I can, I consider a lock that he wins a job because of his kickoff ability. So Badgley is, has not been good with kickoffs in his career. And that, will definitely be a factor in this competition. I think, I think Sly, much like Sam Hall in the quarterback position, I think Sly would have to really show some inconsistencies or that he hasn't maybe improved in the extra point area. You can't, you know, he was not very good there and, but he's got the edge on kickoffs and that is a big deal to them. It's hidden yardage. So, and I know with the new kickoff rules, could it be different? Sure. But with Badgley, the issue hasn't always been distance. Excuse me. It's been hang time. That's been a problem for him. That's why he doesn't kick off. or He hasn't kicked off much the last several years. So unless he improves hang time, I just see it as being a, Joey Sly's job to lose as long as he shows consistency. And so far during practices, that's what he's done. All right. And now the other thing that happened today, Jacoby Brissett took some first team reps. Woo. Now. That's don't read into that. This is not a sign of anything other than, and first of all, again, it's Howell's job to lose. So they, they wanted to give Brissett some first team reps. Oh, did you hear that? You heard that? Okay. I hope you heard that little uh, crash up there. That's, that's some lightning just saying hello. Anyway. So they wanted to give Brissett some first team snaps. And again, because they, because you never know, you have to have him ready and you have to get some level of familiarity with those starters. Now, it's, you're not really talking about a full speed game action reps here, but it was just to get him some reps with them in case he has to go in for Howell. But this remains Howell's job to lose. There's been nothing in camp where you say, oh boy, they're starting the wrong guy. And you haven't seen that yet. And I think the other thing they know with Brissett, he'll always be ready because that's who he is. So they know he doesn't require. So for example, if they go through a couple more weeks and Howell really starts to struggle they know won't take um, Brissett long to get up to speed with others because it's what he's done throughout his career. So just, you know, so you're going to hear that. And it was a couple reps or a couple series that he got in those, in those 10 play little, um, you know, about again, three quarter speed or so. And then the other thing is that Ron Rivera talked about today, and I've talked about him a little bit, but is Benjamin St. Juice and how much confidence he's playing with this in this camp. And he should be like that kid has progressed. And he's always been one, a guy that I've really appreciated because I think he's smart. And I remember as a rookie and I've talked about this before, but it's early in his rookie year. And not only did he start to get better, but he could tell you why, and he could tell you what he saw. And one of the things I liked with him is he went back and watched a lot of other corners this off season, watched their film to see, are there things, what, how do they handle certain situations, et cetera. And to incorporate that into his game. So, but I also, that confidence gets shown when, when players start, you would think, you know, these guys are in the NFL, they should be very confident. It's all about, it's all, it's all relative, man. They have the confidence to play in the NFL, but then you've got to have the confidence to make this play and know that you can go, that you're reading it right and you can react this way. And when you do that, you just move differently and he's been moving differently. And I think the nice thing with that I like about St. Juice, he's playing physical and I've seen that in, in, in some of his jams and when he goes up against Terry McLaurin, for example, but he's also playing smart. And in that zone match, I think that's a huge thing. He had a nice pick on, I think it was Sunday. I didn't talk about it on here because I kind of forgot, but it was, a, or maybe it was, maybe it was Friday even, but it was a really good pick. It was, a, it was um, uh, drops into an area and how makes the right read, right? He's trying to throw over the top of him. He makes the right read. But he probably, in terms of like, that's the receiver who's probably open. But because of the way St. Juice handled it, probably shouldn't have thrown the ball, but he took a shot over it. And St. Juice's length and positioning gets the interception. So there you go. Anyway, that's it for me. So let's get to your to the live stream questions. I'm going to start with my guy down in the Virginia Beach area, Williamsburg area, Jim Ducebella, who covered the team for a very long time, was a great mentor for me and modeled about how you need to approach a job and a terrific writer. Anyways, Deuce wants to know, can Stromberg play guard? And I'm glad you asked that because that is a question that they want to figure out because if you're going to, if you're going to be a backup and you want to be active on Sunday, you better be able to play another position. So can he play guard? Don't know yet. I do think, and I did hear the other day that they're going to at some point, 
try him at guard because they need to see, because again, if you're just a one trick pony in the offensive line and you're a backup, you, it's hard to make you active on Sunday because you know, you, he's going to take the spot of, for example, Tyler Larson, Tyler Larson could play center or guard. So they can easily make him active Stromberg. They're going to, they're going to look at that um, at some point this camp, I believe. So School is out and summer is here, so it's time to plan your next family adventure. With eight different levels, 16 courses, 250 climbing obstacles, and over 4,000 feet of zip lines, the Adventure Park at Sandy Spring, located in Montgomery County, Maryland, is the largest ropes course and zip line park in the country. Beat the heat and join us after dark for some night climbing. When the sun goes down, the park is lit up, allowing you to climb under the stars. Check out their glow-in-the-park events for extra glow lights and music throughout the forest. Want to keep your feet on the ground? Grab a bite to eat from the food truck and give axe throwing a try. Perfect for first-timers or experts, their projector systems allow you to throw at traditional targets, play tic-tac-toe, connect four, or even hunt zombies. Listeners of this show can get $5 off any ticket by entering the code KIME23DC at checkout. That's promo code KIME23DC, K-E-I-M-23-DC. Now open seven days a week. This is the perfect time of year to get outside and join the adventure at theadventurepark.com. Virginia Slim wants to know, how's the Leno and Young matchup? Um, So I would say not bad, and I think... The one thing is, like with Leno, is it because he's a veteran? I think he gets caught up more in what he's doing versus what someone else is doing. So, for example, if you go into those one-on-ones, and I even talked about this last week, do you do you look at who won or lost the rep? And his thing is more about what he's doing versus what the other guy did. So, but it's been a pretty good matchup. There were times where Young has looked really good in that matchup. I'll be honest, but I don't think that Leno has looked bad, if that makes sense, especially early on. Early on, you'd see uh, Young in those t- full team drills doing a really good job getting off the ball. Once they start putting the pads on, the offensive line can handle th- situations a little bit better and with more physical physicality, as coaches like to say. But, um, you know, in the one-on-ones, you'd, it looks like it's it can be, I don't know about even, but I don't think it's it's one-sided by any means. And I, I, think, the, I think what you see, though, is, is that Young has, has shown that he can be get off the ball like he used to. But the key for him will always be, do you start, do you abandon that stutter step stuff? Because if you do, you have a chance to be more consistent. If he starts doing that a lot, it's okay as a changeup once in a while. But if he starts doing that a lot, that's when he's going to get himself into trouble. Nathaniel Roberts, you mentioned Tabida, and it's, it is pronounced Tabida, because I even asked him, possibly taking over for the enemy if he becomes a head coach. EB's intensity is constantly mentioned. How is Pritchard's? Listen, as an offense coordinator, first of all, I think he's a guy that I know when they, they got him that it was, you want to get those good young coaches in your system. I think that's what Pritchard can potentially be for them. So yes, at some point, I don't know if they would deem him ready enough after one year in that role. Um, but I, I don't know, but I do know like if, if the enemy was here for a couple of years, but the key for Bienemy, it's it's not for, for any offense quarter, it's not the intensity doesn't have to be, you don't have to be out there yelling. That works for Bienemy. That's not how Pritchard is. He's energetic. I think that's important. And what I also say, like Sean McVay was had a different energy. Kyle Shanahan had a different energy. And that energy comes from, you know, the excitement you have for your game plan. Your, you know, again, energy is bigger than 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 just like yelling, because there are gonna there are gonna be some players who don't like that. And there, and there's, I guarantee there's some players who don't like that. And, you know, you, there are some players who didn't like a lack of intensity by others or the way others were coached in the past. So it's not just um, a one size fits all here. So when you talk about the intensity with Pritchard, I think it's as much the energy that you bring and his ability to, and he's really good at developing relationships and, and, and working with others. So he get that little thing on his report card, works well with others. But I do think it's more important than the, and I think maybe energy and intensity can be the same thing. Like you can have intensity, but it doesn't mean you're out there just uh, yell. And I'm not saying this is the enemy either, but it doesn't mean you're just yelling at people. It means that you're just intense and you bring that, that energy can also result from the intensity. So, you know, I think, I think Pritchard would be very good there, but, it, but the key for an offensive coordinator is 
what kind of, you know, do you get your players excited about the game plan? Because ultimately that's what's going to, that's how the enemy is going to have success here. He's got to get the game plan. He's got to get them excited about that. And they, and to get them to feel like, yes, this gives this team a shot to win tomorrow. Or, or you know, if they're at a meeting Saturday night, whatever, that's what you have to do. So the ability to sell that, that's why they loved Kyle Shanahan. It's why they love Sean McVay, you know? And, and so I think that's, that's a bigger key than just, than anything else. <clears throat> All right, John I. Frady wants to know, where is the weakest link on the line? Well, I think the biggest question is is left guard because we don't know who's going to play there. So I, I don't know about weakest link. That would That's where, because we don't know who it's going to be. And I think that's where your most inexperience will be. I think Wiley, because of his experience as a tackle, I think he'll be fine. Cosme at right guard, I would not put him as a weakest link because I think he's got good footwork there. I think the one thing that he has to remind himself not to do is to be overly aggressive because when when he loses, that's it's usually a result of that, especially like in those one-on-one, sometimes a goal up against somebody like a pain. And if he just kind of wait, be a little bit patient, then aggressive, he's better than if he's just aggressive right off the ball. So, but I, I like where I think he can get to Gates. I think can be a, I think Gates can be fine for them. And I also, I told you this the other day, I think his demeanor, he's got that. I think he can bring a little bit of the nastiness for them that I think the co- other coaches would really appreciate from that group. So then you look at the left side. Now you, so again, we know what Leno is, right? We don't know what's going to happen to left guard. That would have to be the area. Doesn't mean it's going to be a, a a horrible spot because we don't know. I mean, we haven't seen Charles be healthy for an extended time. We haven't seen Chris Paul in that role. I think they both offer something you can build on, but we don't know what they're going to do. Raymond said he smashed the like button. Good job, man. Do you see a St. Juice Forbes combo starting on the outside this season? Yeah, I think that's definitely a possibility. In fact, you know, let's, well, it's funny because they released their depth chart today and the depth chart and they released it is really kind of a, it's a non story that gets talked about because often more, a lot of times it's, it's not the coaches putting it together. It's, it's, you know, PR people or staffers doing that because it's just, there's, it doesn't mean anything just yet. Now, of course we know who the starters are. They've been working it, but with the corner, what they listed is they listed three corners and they listed St. Juice Forbes and Fuller. So I, I think if you want to get your, listen, I think, I think a lot of Kendall Fuller, but you drafted Forge for a reason and St. Juice, I think is your best corner. So, you know, you're going to, he certainly St. Juice can go play inside and he's going to be good there when he has to, but that's, so yes, I can see that. I mean, you drafted the guy in the first round and they're going to play a lot of three corner sets. So, you know, both, all those guys are going to play quite a bit. Big X four two Oh wants to know, Hey John, pretty quiet. And Curtis Samuel besides injury thought besides the injury thoughts on him and Cam pretty quiet. Yeah, I agree. Now, why is that? So we'll find out. Now, early in camp, you saw him used a little bit more and you still see him getting used. It's, it's, but I do think it's just, I think it's going to be an interesting situation to watch because, you know, you have, listen, McLaurin and Dotson are the guys at receiver. Those are going to be your big play guys. And I think Dotson, like, I really think he can have a, a, a really good year. I think a lot of that kid. And then McLaurin is McLaurin. And then you're going to, they want to use the tight ends. They want, they, they've been getting Deami Brown involved a little bit more at times. You know, you can see him, you might see him on some screens and just seeing what he can do. Cause he's got the speed and he's a little bit of a bigger receiver than compared to somebody. I think they, they kind of like that and they want to see what they have in him. And then you have, I think the running backs going to be involved a lot in the past game, Robinson and Gibson. And they've been, they've been pleased with how Rodriguez has caught the ball, but you still look at Robinson and Gibson. So where does that leave Samuel? There's not an, they're not going to be a lot of ball. You know, you you got one football and it's going to be hard to keep everybody happy and get everyone involved. So I don't know, but it's, could he be a guy that goes down a little bit of production possibly? And I, but I don't know. I mean, I just, I, but I agree with you. He's had, he has had a quiet camp. And when you look at how things are going, it's been, there've been a lot more involvement. I think you look, again, I go back to the tight ends and the um, running backs. This is, this is, I think they're going to have a bigger role in the offense than they did last year in the past game. And don't forget like Scott Turner was very familiar with Curtis Samuel thought, thought he was like one of the smarter players he had coached. So I know he wanted to really work to get him the ball more. And so, you know, uh, the that's not, he doesn't have any sort of ties to him. And not that it's all about getting one guy the ball, I just think that in his offense, they like to get the tight ends involved 
and the running back. So I think he'll, he'll still be a, he'll still be a factor. I just don't, I don't, you know, you're not, you, you're right. He's had a quiet camp. Is Jartavius Martin going to take on a lot of McCain's role or will Martin run with more with the second unit and will we see more of Force? Well, Force is going to play. I mean, right now, and I go back to the, I mean, basically what we've seen throughout camp is Force has been consistently working with the starters. Percy Butler's taken reps there too. And of course, Cam Curl. So where does Martin fit in? Well, he's been a, if they go to a three, three safety or two, four safety set. YouTube is the new home of NFL Sunday Ticket. Watch all your favorite NFL teams out of market Sunday afternoon games all season long, exclusively on YouTube and YouTube TV. Sign up now. Terms and embargoes apply. Which they can. He can play the slot. So the interesting thing is, um, and my, my guy Matthew Paris pointed this out on, on Twitter, but they have Martin listed in the corner as a corner on their depth chart. He can play corner safety. So he's a, he's that hybrid guy that they can use at both spots, but I, could I see him playing? Um, you know, I, I, I think he'll have a role on this defense. Definitely. You don't, you can't draft a guy in the second round and not, and I do know that they really like him because of his versatility. So he does get reps with the starters at times, depending on the package, um, you know, as a second round pick, would you like to see him play a lot more? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a higher pick. And for years, they've always had issues with those second round picks. I think the issue here for him is finding a way to get him involved versus the talent. I like the kid. I think he's very smart. And they, I know that Rivera likes that. He was basically uh, recruited and coached for a couple of years by Lovey Smith. That's, that's one of Rivera's guys. So it's someone he really respects. But I, but I do like, I like what I see from Martin. I talked about this before when you're watching him in the slot. So that's a lot of where we've seen him is in the slot. But what I've seen him a couple of times, very patient feet, very settled. And a lot of that I think comes from just understanding route concepts, what to buy, what not to buy from a receiver on their fakes. And the other day, like I, you know, the, the, the ability to disguise, I think that's one thing that this secondary can do very well. And saw him the other day, line up in the slot, looks like man drops back deep middle takes away a pass from Jacoby Brissett. It just takes away an option. I think it fooled him. And so those are things that I think he adds, but I think the secondary can do a lot of that. Dave Meyer, good question. Why are we worried about losing Mason Brooks? Well, listen, there's no worry at this point. I think what's happening here, Dave, and you know this, like every year there's a couple of guys who get mentioned a lot. It's like, oh, he's the one, he's the one, right? Well, you know, he's the, and more often than not, I it's been, in fact, it's, I'd have to really think about a time where this team lost a guy like in this situation where you say, Oh, you just, you just blew it there. And there's always been, you know, we'd hear this about Cam Sims and I'm a Cam Sims fan, but Cam Sims was always, a, you know, always a guy you can't cut him. They'll get, someone's going to pick him up and nobody ever did. Now they lost in this off season. And I know they'd like to keep him back. Would have liked to have had him back. The point is, you know, I think people get a little bit excited about certain players at this time of the year, because you read about them. And I will say this, Mason Brooks has a shot to develop into a starting NFL player. And when you watch him, but I also think that, you know, let's give it some time. See where he goes. What we're, what everybody's basing this off of is, is a couple of really good reps in the one-on-one against Fidari Mathis. And I think like Brooks really, to me, I mean, he opened, I wouldn't even say he opened some eyes. He got people excited, but he was a priority free agent for a reason. And there were other teams that definitely wanted him. You know, I, 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 believe the Browns wanted him. I think the Eagles probably wanted him. So I think those are, you know, so could somebody snatch him up? Yes. It's going to be a hard one here because I think what they really want are some young guys to develop on this line. The problem is you're going to have a, a young guy in Stromberg as a backup, a young guy and a, a rookie in Daniels as well as a backup. I think Daniels needs some work. Then you know, what if Chris Paul, if, if Sadiq Charles is starting, you have another backup who's a young, inexperienced guy in Chris Paul. So that's three. It's hard to keep a lot of those. You're going to keep, if you can keep four or five backups. So Tyler Larson would, I'm, at this point, I would certainly have mom there because of his versatility and he can play center, he can play guard. And then who's, so where's the, where's the fifth one? And, and it, you, know, you have Cornelius Lucas. So it could be hard to find a way to keep him on the 53-man roster short of an injury to someone else. So should you be worried? You know, I don't about worried, but I think could he could he develop into something someday? Yeah, I do think he can. But worried, I think, is a strong word. And I think, you know, it's I think he's looked good for the spot he's in. 
He was working with the second team yesterday, so that's a good sign for him. But I think we have a little bit of a ways to go before anybody should be worried. And I'll say this, if they, if they get to the point where they're worried about losing him, they're going to find a way to keep him. So, yeah. How much of a possibility that they had the advantage of the new third QB rule? Because although the third QB doesn't count against the reactive roster, they still count against the 53. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know that they're going to need to keep three quarterbacks. So I don't I think they're going to want to keep guys elsewhere. So I'd be a little bit surprised if they kept Fromm on the 53. Um, with Jacoby being an experienced backup, they're good there. But, you know, we'll see. But because if you keep that third guy, then you're going to, are you keeping only three tight ends? You keeping only nine offensive linemen. I just ran through that. You're going to keep only nine defensive linemen. One on a future show, we're going to go over all these positions, like why it could be hard, why you'd want to keep 10 defensive linemen. You know, what if you want to keep, you know, is it five or six receivers, right? That Because you're going to cut someone else if you do that. Is it, do you want to keep Alex Arma as a fullback? So that would give you four backs most likely. And so can you, you can't keep, it's hard to, three quarterbacks for this team right now might be a little bit of a luxury because, I don't know that Fromm is going to go anywhere. I think it would settle coaches' minds about how many guys you have available in a game. But I just, I think to, to occupy that roster spot would be um, difficult. So, yeah, Yoshi wants to know, how concerned should we be about Logan Thomas? I don't know about concern right now. Let's see what happens and how long he's out. And let's see when he gets back onto the field, just even working or, or, or you know, stretching with the guys, going through individual drills. Um I think the concern I have is that when, again, when guys get older, stuff like this happens, right? And it's harder to shake that. And, you know, we had a year a little bit like this last year, but that was different coming back from the injury, et cetera. So, you know, just some, it bears watching. I don't know about concern yet, but it certainly bears watching. We're on this incredible tour of a troll themed Norwegian town, but we get into a dumb argument. Our guide saves the day, whispering from behind a troll statue. Don't fight. You're missing the view. One app over 300,000 experiences you'll remember. Do more with Viator. All right, Virginia Slim, if this if this Sunday was week one, would Hal float or flounder? Is he ready? Well, it's not week one, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter if he's ready. I don't think he'd flounder. I don't get that. Like, he doesn't look overmatched. I've seen quarterbacks out here that can look overmatched or don't look good. I don't put him in that category. What I like about Hal is that he doesn't get rattled and he's been, you know, he had a tough week on a tough day last Saturday and he responded with some good, some good days. And so I, I know, and someone else brought this up. I think it was JP Finley. We were talking about it. He hasn't like, he hasn't had days in a row. You don't see that. And there are a lot of reasons why this offense is they're behind the defense. They should, there should be, that's a different, it's a new offense. It's an experienced defense, but I don't look at Hall as a guy that's, like not going to be able to handle the moment. So I would, especially since they're playing Arizona, I'd say he's going to float. I don't, I don't think he's going to flounder now for the season when he's getting some better defenses, then we're going to learn a lot about him. And I think I'll be honest, man, that, that Baltimore two days practice, it almost feels like their, their summer Super Bowl because they're going to put a lot on that pra those practices because of what it can reveal to them. One of the weaknesses I think they've had over the last couple of years is the inability to act fully gauge all, some of these starters that they weren't sure about, um, whether it was whether it was the quarterback position or another or safety, right? Certain guys that they maybe put in spots when they had Apke as a starter in 2020. Well, he did look good in their practices, but in the games he did not. And so it took them a while to realize that this scrimmage or this practice, those practices will help give them a better feel for certain players. It'll give them a good feel for where Howell's at. It'll give them a good feel for where, where the offensive line is at, et cetera. So anyway, so I think, but I don't think he's going to flounder, but I also know that he's got a few weeks to go. Any word on the James Smith Williams or Cam Curl contract situations? Not, not at this point. And that's something I want to check on. I know that Rivera talked to Josh Harris last week. I'm sure you go over all that stuff, but I have not heard anything anything new doesn't mean nothing new is going on. It's just that that hasn't been a focal point. So I'm going to get on that. Theo wants to know, do you think Jahan can usurp McLaurin as the lead in the passing game? Would it shock me? No, but I, I think the, here's the hard, here's the thing with Terry, even last year, he didn't, I didn't think he had like this really noisy training camp. In other words, like I didn't feel, I thought he was good. I think he looked like Terry, but then he went out and had a really strong season. So in other words, it wasn't like there he and, and Wentz or the quarterbacks were on this great connection. And then, um, you know, 
but he went out and did what he did because that's what he does. But can I see Leno having, excuse me, <laughs> Leno, can I see Jahan? It would have shocked me. No, because I think Jahan is that good. And then it's like, how are you using guys, et cetera. Um, but I think they'll both be very effective in this offense because the speed that they both offer and the effectiveness of their quick game ability. I think that's where like Terry's really good off the line. So I think he's going to have some advantage there. And plus he's just a guy you want to get the ball to because very few guys can get that team going like the way McLaurin can, when he gets some big plays, he, you talk about intensity and energy. That's what he brings when he gets in that competitive mindset. Um, but I really think a lot of Jahan. And so, you know, nothing would shock me because I just think a lot of the kid. Javon Alvis says, compared to last year, does Howe look dramatically different from Wentz did at this point in camp? Good question. The hard part to know, though, is, first of all, it's a new offense for both of them. So, so where the difference is, you saw Wentz airmailing a lot more passes. And I think that's, that's a big difference. I think you see, for example, from Howe, a, a really good grasp of the quick game. I think that's going to be a bigger factor. Now, I think that's also more of an emphasis of this offense, but I also think it's something Howell and these receivers do well. When, when, and I, I've said this before, when they drafted or then we signed, traded for Wentz, I heard a lot about, I heard from some people here about his ability in the quick game. They thought it would help there, but it really didn't. It didn't, it didn't pro, um, progress that way. So I think where you see it is you don't see the air milling. Like I remember talking to coaches after practices and there were some, there were some legitimate things that you weren't sure about the receiver routes, the depth, et cetera, et cetera. But when you talk to coaches afterwards, they would kind of look at you kind of funny last year. Like when you'd ask about Wentz, like, why would we be worried about that at this point when you, you know, the accuracy and all that? Well, some of that played out during the season. Now, some of it too, wasn't just the, the air mailing. It, it was also the, the decision-making and the processing and, and, you know, holding the ball a little bit longer, all those kind of things. But um, is there a dramatic difference? I, I think, how, I think, like I said, how looks like a guy who I think can play in this league. And does he, I wouldn't say he looks awesome. I think he makes some good plays. I think he makes some good decisions. I think he makes some decisions. They, they have to say like in a game, you can't do that. So you see, you see a little bit of everything, but I think you see a guy who, who can build on that. And so, but it's funny because I was kind of thinking about that the other day, but you know, Wentz looked the part, right? And I mean, he, he's the guy, he's the big guy, he's got the big arm, but there were too many times where there was misconnections. And then there were some days where it looked, it looked pretty good, but there were, the air mailing was, was a consistent one in that. And there were, that, listen, that was true. Even on, when they're not having defenses, that's where you would say that's a problem. All right, Todd Labor wants to know, how is John Bates doing in training camp? He's John Bates. He's doing what he does. He's a blocker, and he's going to be an occasional pass catcher, just occasional. So, you know, he's doing about, you know, he's been fine. Like, and when you watch him, he does a good job with his feet. When he's blocking on the line, that's what he does. So he's doing what John Bates does. Tay Massey wants to know, how is Derek Force playing? Playing well enough that they keep him in the starting lineup, right? And I think where he's, they like him, they, they feel like he's progressed in the past game just with his knowledge of routes and all that. And it's funny to say that because he did a nice job with some creating some turnovers last year, but the consistency they think is better. And it's his second year in this particular system. So I think they like where he's at, but you know, it's funny because in the off season, you would hear a little bit like, you know, is, is Butler going to pass him up? And Butler and curl, they get, they draft Carl Martin, but Forrest is there. And he's staying. And he's been staying in there, and and they again they like his progression in the, in the pass game. It's a couple a couple more questions, and I think the storm has passed, so that's good. And the house is still standing. That's even better. All right, Virginia Slim. Going back to Virginia Slim, you're getting two in today, man. So Samuel downplayed the result, the severity of his groin injury. Do you think Forbes is doing the same thing? It's not even remotely close. Um, it was it was a tweak, and he was back out there today with Samuel. Like, that whole situation a couple of years ago was about way more than just that. And the team downplayed it as well. And, and, you know, it was fine. We found out later he had to have the surgery. So it was way, way, way dramatically different. And, you know, just cause it's a groin injury doesn't mean it's the same thing there, but again, he was out there. So no, I don't think he's downplaying at all. Young, young, you, how many games does Sam Howell need to win in order to be considered a franchise QB? I don't think it's going to be the games that they win because there's, that's going to be dependent on other people as well. I think it's just, you have franchise QB to me, first of all, you know, the definition of a franchise versus an elite quarterback. And 
you know, to me, a franchise guy is a guy who can start for you and start for you for several years. I mean, is Kirk Cousins a franchise QB? Well, he's been a quality starter in this league for a while. You can debate that. But I, you know, I, I look at can, an elite QB as one who you can, who can make others better, right? Is, is that what you say in a franchise QB? I think what you want is he, can he be a guy who can start multiple years for you and you feel good about it? Um, I, again, I'm not going to look at the wind toll on that because what if the line doesn't progress the way they hope or isn't what they hope? Then is that, is that Howell's fault? No. What if, you know, um, but I think what you want to see is consistent, steady improvement, not making boneheaded decisions, although guys like Brent Favre did that all the time, right? I mean, it's what, it's what he did early in his career, but it's the big plays, um, being able to win when you don't have everything else going for you. That's when you know you've got a guy who can, who can, be, can lead your team versus a guy who's just kind of taking care of the job, of the, of the position. Komodo, um, what are the things you're looking for most in the preseason? I appreciate the compliment. Um, the progression, I want to see how the line progresses. I want to see the line against a different defense. How do they progress? Because again, we're we're only we're seeing them work against a defense that is should beat them right now, right? It's a it's a good defense. It's it's um it's one of the best defensive lines in football look against another offense. What does how do they game? They're not going to game plan a ton in the preseason, but how does it look when they're actually going up against a different group? Same with how. So that's the thing. That's the number one thing. Cause th- that's, that's how this defense, that's how this team is going to be good. If they're going to be good, it's going to stem from their improvement and from Sam Howell's improvement. So that's what I'm looking forward to seeing the most. I'm going to do about three more questions. All right. All right. Well, Washington command center, this must be in re- response to somebody else. Stromberg's going to be a hell of a center. He might be, he might be a hell of a center, but, and, and I'm not sure what that was in response to, if that's someone else on there. However, the thing, and he might be, but here's what, here's the hard part with that situation. They signed Nick Gates to a contract where essentially he would be the starter for two years. So you draft a guy in the third round who, if all goes well, is going to be a backup for you for two years. Now, is that the worst thing in the world? No, if he can go on, because Gates has his own injury history. What if he need him? So then you could be covered with a young guy and that could be really good. He could be, I think, the one thing I've liked from Stromberg, like, you know, he looks like he needs to get a little bit stronger, but I felt like he had a pretty good day yesterday. And um, so we'll see, but I think to get on the field, to be active now, he's going to have to learn. I think he's going to have to play some guard or at least learn it to make himself a little bit more valuable. All right. Sean Jackson wants to know who's going to get the most snaps at slot St. Juiced or in the, or the rookie. And now with the rookie, are you talking about Quan Martin or Forbes? Forbes isn't going to get a lot of time in the slot. That was a couple of day, That was a couple of snaps in the spring just to get them just, just in case. But I think if, in the, if you're talking about Quan Martin, well, it's going to be St. Juiced because if they go to a lot of three corner sets, then you're going to, and it just depends on the game and who you, what you're facing or who you're facing, et cetera, for the game plan or the package, but you'll get, you know, you if in an ideal situation, three corners is going to be Forbes and Fuller on the outside, St. Juiced in the middle. Now, there are going to be times where this is one thing I really like about this defense is the ability to be flexible. So you can have you can go with a four down lineman, one linebacker, and then six DBs and feel pretty good about it. You could go with four down linemen and seven defensive backs because you have guys like Martin and four, excuse me, and Cam Curl who can play up in the box and feel pretty good. So that, but yes, if you're just talking about him and Martin, then it'll be it'll be St. Jews. But again, it, then it's package dependent, and um, you know, um, so we'll see. Has 90 it drive by cars with Allen? Has 99 improved his number of moves? Um, I've seen him get a little. I've saw I, I have seen some better inside rush moves. So I don't think you're going to ever have this big toolbox of moves for for Young. The biggest thing for him, and this is where he succeeded at Ohio State, and it's where he succeeded as a rookie is the explosion off the ball and playing with violent hands, narrowing the, narrowing your, uh, the, what you're attacking to one half of the lineman. That's a big thing. When he started doing that as a rookie, he really took off. So if he does that, like if he just adds another move with that, it's fine. I don't think he's ever going to be a guy that has a ton of moves um, or would need that. So, you know, I think that'll be, you know, I'm not as worried, but he looks, he has looked pretty good when, when I've, focused on him and I need to focus back on him because I didn't watch him as much this week as I have in other weeks but he's so but yes anyway there you go all right Blaine all the questions I have at this point going to be answered by watch seeing games I would agree with that and I think that's listen that's the way to go because you know we don't know and I think the old line is a question how is going to be a question until we see more 
I do like him, but we need to see more. Nathaniel Roberts, Roberts wants to know, have you seen a no, noticeable impact of Mathis? I think his impact is going to be in those, those Cinco packages, the five defensive line packages playing over the nose. He's a tough move. He's not going to be a guy that's going to just go, go out and get after the quarterback, et cetera, um, because that's not his thing. Occupy that middle and keep, keep those dudes off the linebackers. That's what he does. So he gives you that advantage in the Cinco package. He and Ridgeway can do that. And so that's, that's what, that's what he's going to give you. Anyway, that's, you know what? I'm going to answer one more. I'm not touching. Okay. Kenny school. So I haven't answered anything from Kenny. Let's go. Does Howell seem durable when you watch him play? Yeah, I think he, I think he can be durable. How, how is not, he's not a tall quarterback, but he's not a small quarterback either. I think, and he's, 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 he's built pretty solid. So I think that's okay. I also like that he's got some mobility so he can get away from, from pressure. One of the things that, you know, you watch like Kirk Cousins, Kirk Cousins, I don't want to keep bringing him up, but size wise, like Kirk is not a big guy either, but what he was is he got rid of the ball quick. I think Howell has that ability to do that as well. And that also helps you protect yourself. You know, he's been mobile, but he's not, um, he doesn't, when I remember watching him in college, I don't remember taking a lot of like really bad hits. And I think last year he seemed to understand what he needed to do with the ball and when he could run and how to get down. So I think he, you know, we don't uh, listen, injuries can happen to anybody in this league. um, But I don't worry about that as much with him at this point, you know, just because I don't think that it's been um, it's again with quarterbacks, you never know, but that's not a big concern because I think he's solid enough built solid enough that he should be able to withstand that. All right, folks, listen, I went a little bit longer than I thought I would. I appreciate all the questions, everybody joining me. And I hope this went better than the last live stream I did. I want to do it from home so I get better audio, better everything. And I'm just glad that my house is still standing after that storm blew through here. Anyways, I appreciate you joining me. Always appreciate you tuning in. Without you guys, there's no, there's, there's no one to talk to. So I always appreciate it. I'll be back on Tuesday with another practice report. And hopefully we can do another live stream later um, in the next week or two. So talk to you next time. Bye.